Well, good morning, church family. Welcome to those of you that are in the room. For those of you watching online, welcome to Cedar Crest Church. I'm so excited to be continuing our series, Mind Games, where we're looking at what God has to say about our mental health. We did a survey back at Easter where we asked everybody that came, that was close to 3,000 people, we said, hey, what's the number one thing that's stressing you out? Finances, relationships, what is it? The number one thing that came back on our survey was mental health. And so God's word has so many amazing things to say that we're taking these first few weeks of the school year to talk about mental health and what God has to say to us. And specifically, I'm going through five steps that we can go on in a, on terms of our path to the, to the place of mental well-being. And so last week, we looked at that first step. We looked at being in the presence of God. Uh, perhaps you've heard terminology kind of out in the world about being present, about being mindful, and we say yes and amen, but let's be present with the good shepherd because if we can get in the presence of God, then everything for us changes because you were created for relationship with God. Everything on the inside of you that longs for fulfillment, that longs to know what your purpose is and why am I here and why was I born? All of those paths converge when we're with the one who created us, the uncreated God of the universe. Think about this, knit you together in your mother's womb and has a plan and a purpose for your life. And so we talked about the value of just getting in the presence of the good shepherd. And today we're gonna take step number two on this path of well-being and we're gonna be talking about some things that we actually uh, do all the time and sometimes don't realize it. And that's the fact that we believe a lot of lies about our own life and about others and about relationships and about circumstances. And if we will just begin to arrest those lies and take those lies captive and replace them with truth, then we are well on our way to continuing the path towards well-being. Now, you guys uh, may not be thinking about it this morning, but if I just mentioned a couple of examples of how we believe lies, you're gonna be like, oh yeah, okay, here we go. Some urban legends maybe that we buy into. How many of you at your house when you drop some food on the ground that you really wanted to eat have something called a five-second rule, right? So some of you have the 45-second rule. It's like, it doesn't matter how long it's been there, I'm gonna eat it because it's good. And so we, we make up these things that we're like, oh, it's okay, I can get it because there's no germs on it. Scientists have proven long ago, the minute it hit the ground, it was dirty. It had the bacteria on it. But what do we do? We lie to ourselves. This is going to be okay. So I'm going to eat it anyway. And most of the time it is. Your stomach's pretty tough and you can eat that stuff. But we, we tell ourselves this lie and it's kind of spread around. Another lie that many of you might've heard is the one about the fact that every single one of us uh, in, the, in the course of a year while we're sleeping, we're gonna swallow eight spiders. You ever heard that? Yeah, so many of you have heard that. So it's, it's out there. It's not true, but it's something that we all kind of talk about. Oh yeah, I've heard that. Someone told me that before. Uh, the, the lie that you swallow eight spiders while you, while you sleep in a year. Now, there's all sorts of different reasons that we lie to ourselves. We might lie because we actually want to eat that food, even though it fell on the dirty floor. Or we might lie because we're scared of spiders, and so we're just trying to put the fear of spiders in, in somebody else. Uh, but whatever the reason is that we're telling ourselves a lie, it is a fact of just life that there's all sorts of untruth that we buy into, sometimes not even realizing it. And in fact, much of it is motivated. If you look at the at kind of the core motivation of many of these lies, the, the thing that it's motivated by is that you and I have what's called a negativity bias. There's something on the inside of every human being, the way that we are hardwired is to assume the worst or to look out for things that might hurt us. And of course, as scientists have hypothesized, how did that kind of end up getting hardwired into us is through thousands of years of human history, we have discovered that if we avoid pain and if we avoid things that are bad for us, then it, it goes well with us. We live longer, we don't get hurt, we, we have, uh, you know, we're out of, able to get out of the, the elements, roof over our head, right kind of food to eat, all those kind of things. We learned that through thousands of years of recognizing negativity bias things that might hurt us we want to avoid. The problem is negativity bias can help you survive as a, as a species as you evolve over thousands of years, but it can also then creep into places where it was never intended to creep, amen? How about when we get negative about our spouse or we get negative about our job or we get negative about maybe something that God actually intended to be for our benefit, but because of maybe some lie that we're believing that either the culture told us 
or the enemy of God told us or just some false understanding about reality of life. We're believing this lie and so then we end up in this tension and we end up in a life that's not fulfilling and we end up kind of wondering why do I always just feel off and why, why do things not seem to work for me? Negativity bias, it's, a, it's appropriate and helpful in some context, but in many ways, many of the mental health struggles that we deal with are tied to this. Now, let me just call a time out real quick, and, and I wanna just say, there are many of you that are actually in the room today, and I've heard some of your testimonies and stories, that even just being around a large crowd brings you great anxiety. And you're here today because you want to meet with the living God. Uh, we even heard about um, uh, an individual that came and showed up super early and uh, kind of shared with one of our pastors, said, hey, I, I deal with a lot of anxiety, especially around people. And so I got here real early just so I could kind of get the, the lay of the land. And I just want to say for that individual and for anyone else who's kind of taking a risk to be in church, maybe even just knowing the pastor is going to be talking about mental health, there's, there's something in you that's even just hard to trust. It's, it's hard to to let, to let go and, and, and allow God to minister to you because maybe other people have not respected uh, your particular journey with mental health challenges. I just wanna say thank you for trusting us. Thank you for being in the room today. It's not because we're perfect or that we've got something great to offer you, but God is perfect. And he has something absolutely amazing to you and to offer you. And so these five steps that we're walking through are built upon the word of God and so as I lay it out for us over the course of about a half an hour, 35 minutes, my prayer is that you'll just write some nuggets down, some things that stand out to you, and then take that away and, uh, and say, God, now what do you wanna breathe on it? So as we continue today, let me just go back again to this thought of negativity bias. Let me read for you the definition of actually what it is. Things of a more negative nature, for example, unpleasant thoughts, emotions, or social interactions, harmful or traumatic events, can have a greater effect on one's psychological state and processes than neutral or positive things. Even when those positive things are experienced at the same level of intensity as the, neg as the negative thing was. So what scientists have figured out is that once we get into a negative loop, it has a disproportionate effect on our view of reality. In fact, if we have a negative experience and a positive experience at the same intensity we tend to be, uh, our lives tend to be filtered and colored much more by the negative experience than by the positive experience. And so what God wants to do today is he wants to help us reshape the way that we're thinking and the way that we're viewing the world. And because the fact of the matter is, I know this about myself, because I, I so often find myself falling in the track of that, that negativity bias trap, I have what I have kind of begun to refer to as my inner Eeyore that comes out. I don't know if you ever saw Winnie the Pooh or read those books with your kids, but there was this character, Winnie the Pooh, and he was the donkey, you know, with the, the tail that was tacked on the back. And, and Eeyore just, he had a little, not a little bit, he had a lot of a negativity bias. Remember Eeyore? He's like, oh, here we go again. It's not going to be a very great day. There's the rain. We all knew it would rain. And then, like, you know, his friends are hanging out, and Tigger's bouncing off down the road with Winnie the Pooh, and he's like, there you go, always leaving me behind. Knew you would leave me anyway, go ahead. And then they, they have like a dog pile, they're wrestling, they're playing around, and somehow Eeyore ends up on the ground. He's like, here I am at the bottom, right where I belong. You know, it's just this negativity bias. And we, we laugh about that if you've ever seen the movie Christopher Robin or you, you've read the books, Wayne the Pooh with your kids. We laugh, why? Because we see ourselves in Eeyore. Now, we also see ourselves in Tigger, and we see ourselves in Piglet, and Winnie the Pooh. We, and that's the reason that those stories are so brilliant is because each one of those little characters represents us in different moments of life. And what I'm talking with us about this morning, what the Word of God is going to talk about with us this morning is our Eeyore moments, where we fall into the trap of negativity bias when maybe if we just allowed God to do a work in our thought life, we wouldn't be so colored by the negative side, but we would be colored maybe by the positive side. And so I wanna turn in our scriptures, if you've got your Bible with you or an app on your phone, we're gonna be looking uh, at a guy by the name of Jonah. He's one of the prophets of God. Remember in this time in, in the scripture, the Holy Spirit was not present with every single individual. 
The Holy Spirit has been around since the, since the beginning of time uh, as God, uh, but the Holy Spirit was given much later than Jonah in the book of Acts where every single follower of Jesus was given the Spirit of God, which means that we can have that access to our Heavenly Father and we can talk directly to him. But in this day and age, God didn't speak to everyone. God would speak to a specific individual at a specific time for a specific purpose, and those particular individuals that God would speak to were referred to as prophets or the men of God. And so Jonah is one of those guys. Jonah's got a direct line to God, more so than anybody else around him, and yet what we're gonna see is that Jonah bought into a lie. He bought into some negativity bias that equated into a lie on the inside that he was believing that really forms the, the basis of the entire book of Jonah in our Bible, which to me is kind of like, oh, that's a little embarrassing. Poor Jonah. Like, he could have been remembered for anything. He was a prophet. He was the, the man of God. And yet the whole book is about the fact that he bought into a lie. Poor Jonah. One day I'll be able to see him and ask him, man, <laughs> how'd that happen? I hope you're doing all right today. But Jonah believed the lie. So let's, let's read just a little bit of the story, and eventually you're going to discover the lie. Let's begin in Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Now, this is incredible, because God's basically like, Jonah, I want you to go and preach just hellfire and brimstone down on these people. Now, Nineveh, if you're not sure exactly what that is, this was the capital of the Assyrians. The Assyrians were a known, brutal people that would uh, raid other uh, tribes and other nations. They would take slaves and they would overthrow people. I mean, these, these were crazy uh, uh, people in terms of just being violent towards others. And so it's no wonder that, that Jonah would be a little concerned about going there, but I find it interesting that God says, I want you to go and, and let them know uh, how I feel about what they're doing. But it says that Jonah, rather than going uh, to Nineveh, which is kind of present day Iraq, he was about 500 miles away from there, he went the exact opposite direction. And if you uh, kind of know uh, geography, you can picture a map of the Mediterranean Sea in your mind. Uh, Nineveh would have been over here, and, and where he went, Tarshish over here, is the south of Spain, like 2,500 miles in the other direction. Now, I know all of us would love to go to the south of Spain. That's awesome. But when God speaks and God says, I've got something for you, it's probably not the smartest thing to go the opposite direction, but Jonah does that. And so as he is on the other way, uh, the way in the opposite direction, he ends up on a fishing boat going across the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea towards the south of Spain, and this massive storm comes upon the boat. And the sailors begin to try to figure out what's going on. This is not normal. This is obviously God, and we're all gonna die unless we find out who is responsible on this boat. Who has offended God? And they eventually hone in on Jonah and they're like, what have you done? We're all gonna die. And I love this little part of Jonah. This is Jonah 1 verse 12. Jonah's inner Eeyore comes out and he says, well, pick me up and throw me in the sea, he replied, and it will be calm. I know that it's all my fault that this great storm has come upon you. And he was right. God was trying to get his attention and these poor guys, these sailors, they actually fear God. They actually want to do the right thing, and they're like, God's going to be mad at us if we kill an innocent man. And he's like, no, nope, it's my fault, guys. Just throw me in the sea. I'm telling you, everything's going to be fine if you just throw me overboard. And so they do. They throw Jonah overboard, and all of them, all of them survive, and all of them live. And it says that when Jonah went into the water, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow him up. What an interesting word, provided a huge fish to swallow him. Now, many of you have heard that he ended up in a whale. Whale or not, I don't know. The scripture says it was a big fish. And I just wanna pause for a moment and recognize that sometimes in our life we feel swallowed by things and we think, how, how do I get out? How do I, what do I need to do here? Sometimes when we're believing a lie, God will provide something that will swallow your world up in an attempt to get your attention to help you, to help you get on the right path. Hey, is there something in your life that's going on right now that just feels like it has swallowed your whole world up? I would highly encourage you to say, God, is this you trying to get my attention? I wanna listen to what you have to say. And in the belly of that big fish, Jonah 
uh, sort of repents, doesn't really fully say, I'm sorry, (laughs) but he does begin to call on God's name. He at least recognizes again, God, you're good, and you are God, and I'm not. And there's this long prayer from Jonah, and it says that After he prays this prayer, this fish vomited him out on the beach. (laughs) In other words, this thing that had swallowed him vomited him out onto the beach. And then it says this in John chapter three, verse one. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Can anybody say an amen for a second chance? Come on, Jonah got a second chance. I'm glad I've been given more than one time a second chance. Verse two, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim there the message that I give you. And in verse three, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. So Jonah ends up doing what God said now. I think I would too if I had been swallowed by a giant fish and then vomited out on the beach. It would be, yes, sir, how high should I jump? I mean, here we go, right? And so he's now on the right track. He's heading in the right direction. And it says that he went into Nineveh. There's over 100,000 people. This was a large, again, capital of of a massive, powerful empire. And he began street preaching and doing exactly what the Lord said And he said, you guys are in trouble. You're wicked. But an amazing thing happened. You know, I I don't know about you. Have you ever been like downtown somewhere and heard one of those street preachers with a bullhorn and they're like, you're all going to hell and uh, just calling down hellfire. I'm like, I'm a pastor and I'm turned off by this guy. Like this isn't helping anyone, right? Jonah though shows up and does the bullhorn thing. He's like, you are all wicked and you're gonna die. And it was of God that he did it. And you know what happened? They begin to repent. They begin to say, you are right. And it says they put on sackcloth and ashes and they begin to ask God for forgiveness. And it says even the the king of the city began to call on the name of the Lord, Yahweh, and gave his, his life to God. You see, God had a plan. He was at work. He was doing things that Jonah didn't understand. But Jonah, obviously still believing a lie, um, said this in Jonah chapter four, verse one. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. It seemed very wrong that an entire city would call on the name of God. An entire group of people that are wicked and that have overthrown other nations and taken slaves in, that they would repent and say, God, please forgive us. To Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry and he prayed to the Lord. This is hilarious. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing towards Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. What's Jonah believing? Jonah's believing that an entire city doesn't deserve God's forgiveness. And because as the man of God who's bought into a lie that there are certain people that deserve it, and certain people that don't, he's missing completely the heart of God. God's wanting to save people, all people he created in his image, knit them together in their mother's womb with purpose and a plan for their life. And so anywhere, where anyone, no matter what you've done in your life, where anyone says, God, I am sorry, will you forgive me? I call on your name, will you help me? He is so quick to draw near to that person. But Jonah was believing a lie that some people didn't deserve that. And so he was mad at God and he calls God out. And I love in verse 11, God responds. God says, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals, the end of the chapter. I love that little, that last little part's kind of, and also many animals. So I guess we now know all pets go to heaven. God cares about the animals too. At least if their owners repent, uh, then I guess the animal's on their way there as well. But I love how God says, why shouldn't I care? Jonah, I, I know these people are crazy. They can't even tell their right hand from their left hand. I know they, they're just, I know, but I love them. Why should I not want to show my compassion and my love to them? And you know what? We don't hear Jonah's response. That's the end of the book right there. Oftentimes we'll see in scripture that God will share a principle about someone's life like Jonah and then he'll let it hang so that you and I are confronted with the question, how would we respond? Are we gonna believe lies about others or about ourselves that we make up and buy into those lies and allow those to become our reality? Or will we look to God to be the one who says, this is truth about life. 
This is truth about you. This is truth about your identity. God is the one that determines truth. And when we try to figure it out, we're gonna have a hit and miss experience our whole life. And so really the bottom line of what we're trying to understand here is that if your mind rehearses it, your life will eventually reveal it. Let me say this again. What you rehearse in your mind will eventually be revealed in your life. What are you rehearsing in your mind? What kind of thoughts are you allowing to enter your mind? What is going on? If you were just to do a thought audit about your day, about your finances, about your relationships, about your friendships, about your work, uh, what kind of thoughts are you thinking there? And are you giving into negativity bias? Are you giving into something that actually is not what God would say about those relationships, what not, not what God would say about that opportunity, or what God would not say about your work, but it has become your reality because you're rehearsing it over and over again in your mind. A few weeks ago, Cody Harmon, one of our pastors, uh, gave a sermon We were in our summer book club series, and he talked about some of the different battles that we face in life, and one of them that he addressed was the battle of the mind. And he gave this particular uh, example where scientists have, have studied the way that the mind works and explained the fact that we all are trying to complete stories all day long. So when we encounter bits of information, our mind wants to complete the loop so that we can be at peace about it because un, uh, unfinished stories cause stress to rise. They call you know, just mental stress to rise and it kind of leaves us uneasy. And so what we do is we go in and we insert information not always knowing if what we're inserting is actually true or not. So practical example, uh, a friend, you hear, friend goes out with another friend, they go out to dinner and they don't call you and invite you. Oftentimes, negativity bias says, oh, they're not good friends anyway. We're finishing the story. Oh, they, they, they always leave me out. When actually, maybe there was something specific that those two needed to, dis to discuss, and it, it wasn't a friendship hangout. It was, hey, can I ask you a particular question? We, know, we don't really know what might have been going on there, but so often we're quick to jump to a negativity loop, and then we get into a loop. Because we've created that story, we start telling ourselves that narrative. And then every single time a person emotionally hurts us, it could be a friend, it could be our spouse, it could be any situation, then we're living life through a filter of a negativity loop that we've been telling ourselves. And now I respond to my spouse out of that hurt that I have from a friend. Now I respond to my kid out of that hurt that I had from a friend. And it's not even their fault. And then all of a sudden the emotions are coming out on this other person. Have you ever been there? I know I've been there. I was there this week. Come on. I mean, this is just what we do as human beings. We kind of drag around with us all of these experiences. And here's what God wants to say to us. Are we evaluating actually what we're looping on? Because what we rehearse in our minds eventually gets revealed in our lives. What are you thinking about? What is going through your mind? The New Testament says this to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and here's the key phrase, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Are you taking thoughts captive to make sure that they're actually the truth of God? Are you taking thoughts captive to actually say, this is the truth about me, or this is the truth about relationship? The way that I've kind of through the years just decided that this makes sense and helps me understand this is I imagine this verse taking every thought captive. If my, my mind is like the club of life, it's like, right? You got flashing going on. I mean, there's just all sorts of stuff happening in the club of my mind. And there's a lot of fun happening in my mind. And there's a lot of things going on. And uh, there's relationship stuff and there's work stuff and there's all sorts of things. And I've got this bouncer called the Holy Spirit that stands at the door. And every time a thought comes up, that bouncer says, let me see some ID. Because you're not coming in if you're a lie. How about you? Do you have some sort of filter, whether it's your finances, your relationships? Again, just go down the list of the things you think about on a daily basis. And is the bouncer of the Holy Spirit there to take every thought captive so the lie can't get in? I don't want a lie partying in my club. That just, that's not going to happen. I only want the truth of what God says about me and what he says through his infallible word. This is why we get in the word of God on a daily basis. I just let it wash my mind. Just cover, cover the club of my mind, Lord, and put the bouncer of the Holy Spirit at the door. Now, I don't know about you, but I've recognized because there's patterns in my life, there's certain lies that think they're on the VIP list. 
And so they just roll up like they're going to go right past the bouncer. Whoop! I'm just going in because Van lets me in the club all the time. And sometimes I have to go, no, 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 no. You're not on the VIP list. You can't get in. So the bouncer, the Holy Spirit, let me see some ID. No, that's a fake ID. You're out. Come on. That's that same thought. Comes back again a week later. No, you got a wig on. No, you're not. You can't. <laughs> You can't fool me. That's the same thought. That's a lie. I'm not letting you in the club. You got to stay out, right? Do you have a filter? Are you, are you gritting life through the truth of God's word, what he says? And are you asking yourself, am I, am I giving into a lie that I don't need to give into? Now, listen, there are times when there are toxic relationships that you probably should get out of. So uh, allow the bouncer of the Holy Spirit to tell you is that relationship toxic and you need to get away from it? Or are you believing a lie about that? You're completing a story that actually hasn't been completed. That's worth a conversation. That's worth going over and, and recognizing that. We, see, we, we do this all the time in our relationships. Maybe just another practical where you've maybe uh, experienced yourself just, you've looped on something, you, you've rehearsed it in your mind, and now it's being revealed in your life. Have you ever watched a scary movie late at night? right? And then the movie's over and you're walking through your dark house. All right, what's going on at that moment in your mind? I, I'm just going to be honest. I, I need to confess my sins. There are times where I've watched something crazy on TV that either scared me or whatever it might have been. And I walked into a dark room and I was like, hey, if anybody's in this room, you know, I turned the light on. And I'm like, man, if anybody saw me right now, but come on, you've done it. That's why you're laughing. You rolled up in your house, bowed up, ready to take somebody out. And you knew nobody's there, but because you've been rehearsing it in your mind, boy, you are like amped. You've been there. And these are just the things that we do. And what we rehearse in our mind gets revealed in our life. What's being revealed in your life? Is health coming out in your relationships, in your finances, in your workplace? Or do you keep having missed signals? And could it be because you're believing a lie? You know, one of the most healthy things you can do if you believe, man, I, I think there might be numerous lies that I've been believing because I'm always missing my spouse. I'm always missing my coworkers. And I, I just, I don't ever feel purposeful in life. What, what lie might I be believing? Man, we would encourage you to get with a licensed professional counselor because there are many that actually love God and have studied and would love to help you. And so if that's you, if you're in that boat, I just wanna encourage you to reach out to us. We've got a whole list of counselors here in our area that we would love uh, to get you an appointment with just so you can sit down. And what I like to call that is just change the oil in the car, man. Just, just pull the plug on me. Ask me as many questions as you want. Let's get to the root of this thing. And they're great at doing it. And the fact that we've got many that love God and have studied to help you and me get to the root of some of the lies we're believing, man, we wanna take advantage of that. Now, in their world, what they would call this is cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy. What that is is identifying a troubling area in your life, becoming aware of the thoughts, emotions, and beliefs about those particular problems, identifying negative, inaccurate thinking, and then reshaping the negative, inaccurate thinking. In church world, we just call that simply replacing the lie with truth. Replacing the lie with truth. And so my encouragement to us today is to recognize that even the man of God, the prophet, direct line to God, knew God's heart, and still gave into a lie, a prejudice in his own heart that not everybody's worthy of God's forgiveness. And so he missed the goodness of God. Man, don't go the opposite direction. Lean into the truth. And when things are not making sense and when it just doesn't seem right, say, God, am I believing a lie here? Would you help me by revealing it? Another great just atmosphere for you guys to kind of do a thought audit is in the context of a small group. We call those life groups here. And you heard this morning the announcement about connect. We'd love to help you get connected to a small group of people. A small group of people is a great place just to have a mirror and say, hey, I kind of am thinking about these things and wrestling with this. Is, does that seem like it, it could be true to you or am I believing a lie? That's a great conversation to have. And can I tell you, I've had that kind of conversation many times with individuals. You know, I've I've been thinking this, but it just, man, it's causing anxiety and worry. And what do you think? That, man, that's not true. That's a, that's, you're believing a lie. Thank you for telling me that, right? 
Those kind of relationships can be so healthy, and so we would encourage you to seek those out. We'd love to help you do it. One more practical uh, is there is a, a lady by the name of Dr. Caroline Leaf. She's a neuroscientist. She is a believer, and she's written some books on this idea of taking every thought captive with kind of the science behind that. Uh, one of those books is called Switch on Your Brain. She most recently wrote a book called Clean Up Your Mental Mess. Um, let me just kind of boil down the, the nutshells of what those books tell us, is that in our brain, there are chemically things going on all day long, and our thoughts, we are literally actually forming uh, molecules in our brain based on where we're thinking. And there's these things called dendrites in our brain which actually hold memories and hold emotions. And when you put somebody under an MRI to look at their brain where anxiety lives and depression lives actually shows up as dark spots where these dendrites have formed in our brain. And so she talks about the importance of learning how to have the bouncer of the Holy Spirit at the club door, taking every thought captive because what we uh, are uh, rehearsing in our mind is gonna get revealed in our life. And it's just uh, one of the little things she says is when you wake up each day, you wake up with 300 billion new cells in your brain. Like overnight, 300 billion new cells were formed in your brain. And throughout your day, as you think about things, what you meditate on becomes your reality. It becomes how the world is. No matter what anybody else says, that's how Jonah can Look into the face of God, so to speak. Know his heart is compassionate and go the opposite direction because he has so bought into those people are evil and do not deserve to be saved. Man, what are you potentially and what am I potentially believing where we can look God in the face and go the opposite direction? Man, Lord, help me. I wanna think the right thoughts. So what does this practically look like? And this is why we asked parents to please take advantage of kids' ministry here at Cedar Crest. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna, I, I, I need a moment to get real. Can I just get real at church? Can we do that? Yeah. Okay, great. Porn addiction, right? Um, how does it become an, I, I've talked to so many men. I don't wanna look at porn. Van, I'm tired of looking at porn. I wanna get free from it. What's going on in me? Well, here's what we understand about addictions like porn or whether it's a pill or a bottle or whatever it is when we have somehow bought into the lie that this thing will satisfy me and it's gonna satisfy me quick, what we're doing is we're literally blazing a chemical trail in our brain. We're creating ruts in the road of our brain. If you ever, most of us are from around Georgia, you've been down a muddy road before where your car gets in a rut and you, to steer the car out of the rut becomes very difficult because you've worn a path down the road. Everybody got that in your mind? So when you have bought into the lie that, well, my marriage is broken and, and my wife won't satisfy me or my husband's not gonna satisfy me, but this, I can go to this, this to be quick and I'm stressed out, it's been a long day anyway and so I just wanna get my need met right now in this particular thing, well then we've run that rut so many times in our brain, it's like a highway through your brain. And so to change from that requires you to actually rewire your thinking. You actually have to bust the rut in the road and you have to begin blazing a new trail. And the only way to do that, stop the lie at the door. Nope, that's a lie. That will not meet my, and I'm, let me tell you something. We talk to men and they even understand not just the negativity for them, but the negativity on the world. Let me tell you about porn. When you look at porn, even if you find it free somewhere on the internet, advertisers are paying those porn websites for every click that they get, making money off of it. And that entire industry is built on uh, modern day slavery and sex trafficking, and many times it's kids that are sold or kidnapped from moms and dads in third world countries to work in brothels and other places around the world. It is dirty, nasty, disgusting from the pit of hell. And men that know that will look me in the face and say, I know it's terrible. And I hate that I do it, but I can't stop myself. I just keep going back and I don't understand why. And I'm telling you, the key is right here. You got it every single day. This is not one time over another. This is today, I'm not going down that road. I will reshape my mind. I will find, God wants to meet my needs. He wants to meet my needs of intimacy. He gave me a sexual drive. All of those things, he wants to meet it healthily. I'm gonna find God's way. I'm not gonna go to the porn, right? And then the next day you wake up, guess what? Same thoughts back at the door of the club. Hey, can we get in today? Hey, I'm 21 now, can I get in, right? And we're, the bouncers just got, I don't care if you're 21, no. You're not coming in this club. And then day three, same thing. God, will you just help me to get, and it takes time to rewire how you think. It actually requires us putting in the work. So 
if it's porn or if it's a lie that your spouse cannot satisfy you, hey, I just want you to know that God's word says something different about that. And it will require hard work. It might require counseling. It will require leaning in. It will require allowing some other men and women into your life and his life and your life and her life, whatever. But we can do this together because God's will for you is to find satisfaction in your marriage and not in a computer screen. How about some sort of stimulant or other thing? Whatever it is that you might have gone to to kind of meet that need. This is why we started with block one last week. Only the presence of the good shepherd will ever ultimately satisfy you. Come on, somebody, let's, let's be honest. Those of us that have looked at porn, I've done that in the past. Those of us that have gone to some sort of relationship or drug or whatever to, to, meet a, to meet a need, I've been guilty of those things in my life. What do we know? We know we always wake up the next day unsatisfied again. And so now we gotta, now it's gotta be more. Now it's gotta be more severe. Now it's whatever the, I always need more because I'm never satisfied because I've bought into a lie that it's gonna meet my need and it may satisfy in that second, but it never satisfies for the long term. And so what do we have to do? We have to learn to go to God and say, God, ultimately only you fully satisfy. Only you fully meet the needs of my life on an ongoing basis. So God, where am I believing a lie? And will you help me to believe the truth? Our minds are powerful and I want you to just have that stuck in your mind today. I want you, I want you looping on this truth that we have to take every thought captive. A couple things just to encourage you about the power of your thought life. Uh, there's a Vietnam POW by the name of Tom Mo. He was captive during the war and um, that was not a place you wanted to be captive. Tortured, you never knew if you are gonna get out. Many, many men died in captivity because they lost hope. They allowed their mind to go to the worst possible scenario. They allowed that negativity bias to kick in. Guys like Tom, he said, I asked him, how did you survive? He said, I built 10 homes in my mind during months of captivity. And he said he would keep his mind occupied by visiting different countries in his mind and remembering the capitals of each one. Another POW played 18 holes of golf in his mind every day. Come on, somebody, you're at work. You didn't play a round of golf, right? It's just, hey, I, I'm, what am I thinking about right now? But he was, doing, he was doing things that brought his soul alive instead of giving in to the, the reality of, of his captivity, knowing and believing that if he just cycled on, I'm gonna die here, that it would become reality. But if he focused on, I'm gonna get out of here one day, that he would get out. James Stockdale, a leader of a group of men in solitary confinement at what they called the Hanoi Hilton. And by the way, this was not a Hilton hotel. This, this was captivity and um, torture. Uh, it said that while he was there, he and his men, they were kept in solitary confinement, but they came up with a system of knocking on walls and on the floors to communicate with one another just to keep their minds active, just to keep uh, that, that hope alive, that communication going. And I, again, just wanna to submit to you that the invitation of Jesus today is to get the thoughts going in your mind of truth and of hope and of purpose that God loves you and he has a plan for your life. And wherever you find yourself in this particular life, don't loop on the negativity of that particular moment, even though it's potentially your reality. Maybe you're in a terrible situation. But begin to loop on the fact that God, when God is forming, who can be against me? Just begin to speak scripture out. When I'm, when I'm financially uh, hurting, God's gonna supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. That's the truth of what he says. And so I've, I feel uh, in a tight spot financially. And so what, what's the truth? What does God's word say? God's word says, trust me, uh, 100% belongs to God. And God says, trust me with that, that 10%. Give that to the storehouse, that's your local church, and that 90% will be more blessed than the 100% was. God actually says, test me in this and see if I won't pour out such a blessing you won't have room to contain it. So when I begin to live the truth of God's word, my 90% turns into more than my 100% used to be, and it doesn't make sense, but what am I doing? I'm rehearsing God's word. And then I say, God, I need help paying this bill. I need, what do I do? And he says, I want you to call this individual. They've got a job for you. I want you to go to this particular place today and you're gonna get a new contract. God begins guiding our steps because we're leaning into the good shepherd. We're taking the lies and thoughts captive that I won't ever have enough. And we're saying, God, I, I trust you. Now that's just one of so many examples. What's your example? What lie are you believing? 
What's the thing that just tears you up on the inside? What's causing stress and anxiety and all of the, the trials in your life? So many times, as I said earlier, if we just get to the bottom of it, there's a root lie that needs to be pulled out and we insert the truth of God's word. Books like Jonah, they end with an unfinished story because God is wanting to finish the story in your life by asking you the question, are you gonna live like Jonah or will you choose to follow the truth? I wanna encourage you guys this week to practice the presence of God and to do that thought audit and say, God, I'm, I'm gonna believe your truth and I'm gonna lean into that. God will never fail you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. His truth, this is what I'm, I'm quoting scripture right now. His truth, when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. If you wanna be free, you get into the truth of God. I wanna say this as we end our time, I wanna pray for you and we're gonna just sing one final song, but um, next week I'm actually gonna be talking about uh, suicide and we're gonna looking at another uh, man of God, not Jonah, but another one who found himself in a deep depression and we're gonna talk about depression and some things that God did in that individual's life and I was gonna deal with suicide next week but actually in the story of Jonah, it actually says that Jonah had so bought into that lie and he was so disappointed in life and even in God, even though God was trying to be loving and compassionate, he said to God, just take my life. And I didn't include that today because I knew I was gonna talk about it next week, but when I got to church this morning, one of my staff members texted and said, hey, I'm praying for you as you prepare to preach today and just had the impression that somebody might be in church today who's thinking about taking their own life and just wanted to submit that to you. And I thought, Lord, I was gonna do that next week, but I knew it was the Lord. And so if you're in this room or you're watching online and you're believing the lie that your life is not valuable and that nobody wants you around, God knew you were gonna be listening to this today. And so he spoke to my staff member to speak to me to say to you, God sees you, God loves you, don't give up. We'd love to have a conversation with you. I would invite you to please reach out to us or a trusted friend and let them know if you're thinking about taking your own life. Um, another just practical tool, uh, our nation just released a brand new three digit phone code uh, for those that are considering taking their lives. It's 988. Literally, this just launched this summer. It used to be a long 1-800 number that nobody could remember. It's simple now, 988. If you're considering taking your life, please reach out, whether it's here or someone on the phone. God loves you, and there's a plan and a purpose for your life, and if you'll just lean in, man, we wanna be friends on the journey, but ultimately we believe God can set you free. Would you bow your heads? I wanna pray a blessing over every single one of us. I'm gonna pray the blessing of taking every thought captive that the Holy Spirit bouncer would be at the door of your mind all week long. Before I pray, is there anybody in the room that just says, Van, I, I need extra prayer this week. I know that as you've been talking, there are some lies that I've bought into. If that's you, while everybody's heads are bowed, would you just lift your hand up? Thank you. I see you down front. Thank you. I see you guys in the back. Thank you. Anybody else? Anyone just saying, I need specific prayer? Thank you. I see you. Thank you. Anyone else? I see you in the back. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord sees you, and as you raise your hand, that's just your way of saying, God, I'm, I'm in the middle of it. And so, Lord, right now, I just pray for every single one of my friends in this room that just lifted their hand to say, I'm in the middle of it, and I need help today. God, would you come? Would you be the great and wonderful counselor and friend that sticks closer than a brother? God, would you bring that peace that passes all understanding to my friends right now, whatever it is that they're wrestling with and dealing with, God, sometimes believing the truth means we have to even stare some ugly things in the face. We actually have to confront things that we're trying to avoid and, and believing the lie actually seems easier because it helps us just to avoid the truth. But Lord, I'm praying for confidence today that every single one of us would lean into your truth, trusting that ultimately that we're gonna get to the other side, not only healed, but fully restored and built up. So Lord, I pray today for every single person, all of us in this room, that we would know what you say about us is true, that we would know that you call us sons and daughters, that you call us adopted, your kids. You walk with us as friends, God. In fact, you 
call us your friends. We also recognize the truth that you are God and you are Lord and you rule and reign over our circumstances. And so there's no storm in our life and there's no giant fish in our life that can swallow us whole because we sit in the palm of your hand. And so I pray that today we would put our trust again in you, that we would trust the presence of the Good Shepherd, that we would proclaim the truth that fear is not our future, you are, that sickness is not our outcome, you are. Lord, we trust you. We love you. I pray that every single person will be filled again, afresh and new with the Holy Spirit. Help us to take thoughts captives this week. In Jesus' name, 